the reason that we, really we ca came together is ostensibly to discuss uh, the exemplars for our time uh, uh, series of books which we've all contributed to. But really, our, um, our uh, uh, real intention is to be able to sit with, with you, Dr. Mustafa. It's a, it's a privilege that I don't have uh, I haven't had for a, lo many, a long time, and it, uh, I look forward to this. And I thought it might be appropriate to read what the Fukara re read in North Africa, uh, or what they sing when they ar arrive in Azawia. Uh, Greetings to the people of protection, wherever they may be. Blessed be they, and how excellent their abode. For them, the guardian Lord has manifested sons of his splendor, would that my cheek were their sandal in the dust. When, dear brothers, will one come with good news of your arrival that we might rejoice and be united? Let me be among you even as I am, for though I am not worthy of being among you, still you are worthy. Peace be upon you, and may Allah ennoble your rank, and may grace and joy always be yours. Days are only sweet if they contain your mention, your, the radiance of my eye and its light. When my eye beholds the faces of my beloveds, that is my prayer offered in the nights of yearning, faces which, when their beauty is unveiled, illuminate the world in all directions. Uh, and th that I just, th 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 that's our sentiment when we come to visit, to visit you. And, and, and that applies to everybody in this book. Uh, he, he, faces, he, when, when they are seen shining, they illuminate yeah. everything around them yeah. to yeah. the horizons. It's just um, uh, enough to look at one of these faces to feel peaceful and happy. Yes. Uh, and uh, we have, to a certain extent, all been able to view not only one of these faces, but any number of them, even if maybe we didn't know what we were looking at, you know. I mean, I think of Habib, but all the, the, all the people visiting uh, Habib Ahmed. You well, know, the, uh, Habib said that um, once you're connected to one uh, ring of the chain, then you connect it to the whole chain. Yeah. And then once um, one of them is looking after you, then they're all looking after you. Uh, uh, and uh, one, once you discover one of them, then he opens the door for you to discover the rest to recognize them when you see them. Yeah. I, I discovered that having known Habib Ahmed that uh, whenever I went, then the uh, awliya were recognizable, whereas they weren't before. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that is something... You know, they open the door for you. That is something that, that uh, I, we've, we've all experienced, is that you, 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 int you just intuitively know someone. You don't know what they are. You can't see their secret or anything, but you know, you just know. You, there's a recognition. You and know. It's, and, yes. and it's... Uh, and it, and it does come from just sitting in the presence of these people. The way I've tried to explain it is th their, they have, their, their ego is extinguished. And uh, that's such an un uh, striking and subtle thing, you know, that you, because they're still people. They still eat. They still sit with you. Uh, they're different inside. But they're different, <laughs> you know, they're different. They're very different inside. I mean, you see what, what the Prophet said. He said, uh, you recognize a man of Allah yeah. because as soon as you see him, you remember Allah. Yeah. That's, the, that's a sign, yeah. that's a mark. Yeah. As soon as you see him, you say Allah, yeah. you remember. Yeah. And that is an unmistakable sign. Yeah. You know, they're always recognizable in that way. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Uh, in, in various guises. Yes. You know, one with a turban, another with a necktie, another in yeah. jeans. Yeah. You know, they, they come in all kinds of and forms, but uh, they all share this particular attribute, yeah. which is that when you see them, you remember Allah. Yeah. Yes. 
the, the, uh, Abdullah, the, we, we, one of the subjects that we talk about is the anonymity of many of these people, where you, you, they, they're veiled, though. Even, and uh, Abdullah has this, he, you know, because of his, his, his state, um, has had the ability of actually capturing a few of these people on the fly, um, with, with you know, just by int intuitively knowing that they're there. And there's a, one photograph, if uh, you might remember it, of a woman in the streets of uh, Multan. of Multan, uh -huh. and it's a it's a priceless photograph because she's looking straight at the camera and she is not well pleased, <laughs> and apparently. When she uh, when she saw Abladim take the photograph, right? It, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he was told later that she disappeared. She disappeared. Yeah. You know, That's why I said there are some people that once you expose them, they have to move they somewhere. Have, they have to yeah. move somewhere. Else. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And <laughs> I really, I mean, I feel ashamed that I took it, but I had to. It was an impulse. I just saw her. I just, I couldn't help myself, you know. <laughs> but she, she was. She saw me as soon as I took the picture. She just gave. But generally speaking, you don't recognize them unless they make themselves known to you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I didn't because they, they scan you first. Yes. Yeah. And they find out which kind you are. Right. If you're the kind who loves them, who respects them, who right. knows who they are, right. then they make themselves known. Otherwise, they stay veiled. Yeah, this is also Sheikh Salih Jafari. Uh, did you were you able to meet him? No, I never. I was in That's England amazing. at the time when uh, because I sat in his in his uh, dirt, uh -huh. so that I had the experience of you know just watching him. He was an extraordinary. But apparently, until two years before he passed away, anyone who tried to take a photograph of him or record him. The recording came out as static, and the photographs didn't, never came out. <laughs> and he said, "It's because I didn't give you permission." No. You know? And then he started to let people photograph him in the last couple of years. It's, I love talking about these people. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's they're the just about the only thing worth talking about. <laughs> yeah. What yeah, else is there? Absolutely. They're the door to to Allah. They're the door to uh, everything that is good. Yeah. You can't reach anything that is good without them. Yeah. So, uh, what else is there to talk about? Yeah. I mean, it's one of the the the, the um, poverties of uh, contemporary Islam uh, or Islamic scholarship is the lack of uh, tapakat literature which you're working on I know I mean I love one of my favorite books is the, is the biography of Imam al Haddad mm -hmm. that he wrote mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful just a treasure and now you're doing uh, the, the uh, bio no, full biography no you've got the blessed valley that you have the biographies of all yeah, the Ba'alas yeah. yeah. yes, from yes. the very start until I, uh, so that was a that was yeah. a big job. I just got, got my copy. I haven't cracked it open yet, no. but I'm, I'm looking so forward Some to biographies it. are more detailed than others, according to the sources, according to the yeah. time. But what comes out is that this is a family of saints, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is quite exciting. There are families of saints, uh, like, for instance, um, the Idrisis in Morocco. Yes. yes. And the Marganias in Sudan. Yes. Um, the Qadr is the children of Sheikh Abdul Qadr are everywhere. Yes. yes. Everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Sheikh Muhammad Radwan you met? Yes. He's a descendant of... Uh, How is he? Of Sheikh Abdul Qadr al Jilani. MashaAllah. And they uh, moved from uh, Iraq to uh, Morocco. And Mashallah. then from Morocco to Upper mm -hmm. Egypt here a few hundred years ago. Uh, so they're all... Uh, the, these um, families of Ahl al-Bayt have it in their... Uh, genetics yes. and yes. the genes, yes. so they form a kind of pool of suitable candidates yes. from which all these great people spring up, uh, and they're, they're genetically predisposed. It comes to them easier than it comes to other people. But on the other hand, when other people uh, are serious enough about their uh, 
about the spiritual traveling, mm -hmm. then they got adopted into this family and they become part of the Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. And that was the um, uh, the indication given by the Prophet Sallallahu when he adopted Salman into yes. the yeah. Ahlul Bayt. So here is a Persian who has become spiritually an Ahlul Bayt. Yes. And, uh, and Habib Ahmed and all the great ones among them, they have this prerogative that they are capable of saying, you are from us Ahlul Bayt. And then you are adopted, you become one of them. Uh, your friend Osman Hutchinson, one of those, he was adopted into yes. the, the Ahlul Bayt and he was yeah. told, you are one of them. Uh, you have the same rights and you have the same duties Allah. as us Ahlul Bayt. So he's, um, and that, in fact, is a, the higher level than the physical level. Spiritual level is always higher, but uh, the uh, Ahlul Bayt, they have both. The uh, physical descendants of the Prophet and the spiritual descendants of the yes. Prophet at the same time. Uh, but the door is open, anyone who wants to get adopted. <laughs> yeah. uh, I knew Uthman when he first became Muslim. And he was, we were together, and then I didn't see him and for the for, until he passed away. I mean, I uh, we I saw him in the 1970s, and he was with me, you know, in Monterey, and then he went off and had his life, and mm. it was in Medina, and I never managed to see him in Medina. But uh, look at that. That's a secret. There's a secret there. You know, you, someone comes from. I don't even know where he was from. New York City. From New York. Mm -hmm. ah. And he'd inherited a little bit of money and he had a little rain, Land Rover or something like that. And then he went off to Medina. And, 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 and we have to be very careful of how we evaluate people or look at people. Because we see everyone at the beginning of their path. And uh, like Hamza Yusuf also was with me in Monterey. And then we, you know, he went off and did what he did and suddenly comes back and he knows a lot more than I do, you know. <laughs> Mashallah. Huh? Yes. How, how did you come to meet Habib Ahmed? Because before you were... Through you, uh, no. Said oh, Muhammad I know. Habib. No, actually, I, when, when Meetings with Mountains was starting to form into a more serious thing, I came to Jeddah and I asked Dr. Omar, I said, who are the important people in Jeddah that I should see mm. and try and photograph? And he said, uh, Habib Ahmed, for sure. Habib Abdul Qadir Sagar. And then his sheikh, but he said, I know he, he said, my sheikh won't let, doesn't like photographs, he won't <laughs> let. But just guys come and see him for the, you know, this is Sheikh Baraka, Muhammad, yeah. Muhammad, uh, And then, Muhammad. and I also had been looking personally for a teacher since, since Mom and Habib, Sidi Mom and Habib had passed away. And um, that first meeting with Habib, I just thought, you know, with him, with the, all his sons and the grandsons, and he was sitting yeah. in the middle, it was like, you yeah. know, the sun with the moon and the mm. stars. I just like, I could see yeah. this whole picture. It was, I just came away with this thing and I thought, there's something really interesting here, you know. Yeah. And then I kept going back. And then I, meant, I, I gave him the D1 and I told him the whole story how Sidi Mom Habib had passed away and there seemed to be no successor to that lineage. And he listened very carefully Habib and then he said, I will find out who the inheritor is. And then we talked a bit more and he was very happy with the D1, I know they told me that, that, that he was really happy to, to have the D1. And then Sayyid Ali said to me, you know when you're in the desert and you can't find water, you can do time on. Mm. And as soon as he said that, I knew Habib Ahmed was my teacher. Because I was, I was stuck on the whole Moroccan, the form of the Moroccan thing. Yeah. And as soon as he said that, I realized it's not, it doesn't have to be, it's like, it's the light of mm. Muhammad, that's what you're chasing. Yeah. Mm. So I knew then Habib Ahmed was my teacher. Yes, and there's this, um inward net connecting all the spiritual masters of the age yes. so that uh, each knows what the other is doing all yes. the time and yes. uh, 
picks up the pieces when something's breaks down and uh, is always ready to welcome you. Yes. And uh, the light is one, there's no difference. It's exactly. Uh, but yeah. the actually people get taken by the um, outward yes, the difference yes. in form and behavior. And Absolutely. And, uh, and, and manners of dealing with things. But yes. the, the inward light, if you recognize that, then they're all your spiritual teachers. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They become a, this uh, connection between the network of uh, the Alawis and the network of the Idrises in Morocco is yes. quite yeah. obvious. Yeah. Yeah. They never met each other. They never even heard of each other yeah. in the outward yeah. dimension. But well, I saw this with uh, Sayyid Omar Abdullah because mm. I spent a lot of time, you know, with him, and he would sit with people and he would recognize someone from a, a different tradition, mm. and they would recognize him, and they would sit down, and immediately there was a bond. Mm. And then they would get up and and I'd say, well, what, who was that? <laughs> and he'd say, Mashallah, who a wasil, you know, and then walk away. Uh, there's so I, I I got used to that. He would he, you know he he would take me to all these like atas al habshi, you know. I could and I tried to go myself once. Knocked on his door. And then nobody nobody answered the door. But when Sayyid Omar came, the, the doors opened and we we spend time uh, because he, he he I think he almost never went out. Habib uh, Atas was uh, very poorly, you know, he was, uh, his health was very um, yes, uh, frail. Yeah. And he had a uh, specific time to receive people. In Juma, I think. Yeah, yeah. we used to go. Twice a week. Yeah. Or otherwise, you had to take an appointment way ahead. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. Um, but so once yeah. I saw, um, we, I was, went to Habib's house in the morning in Jeddah and we went to uh, Mecca for Juma. And uh, he was invited to his, uh, uh, one of his relatives in, uh, in Mecca from the uh, Haddad family, who had also invited Habib Atas Habashi and Habib Abdul Qadr al -Sakaf. So um, we met briefly in the Haram and then Everybody took his car and now Habib's car was the first to reach the house and he immediately went down, went right inside the door and then stood in attention, you know, just leaning on his cane as if uh, sort of a honor guard waiting for uh, you know, a VIP president or somebody yeah. to come in. And he was coming and was Habib Atas Habash. So Habib was standing like this, like uh, very, very humbly, waiting for Habib Atas to, to come in first. And Habib Atas looked at him and stopped, stopped at the doorstep. And uh, after a while, Habib raised his head, come in, Habib Atas. Habib Atas told him, You go in first, yeah, Habib. He said, No, you go in first. You go in first. And then, you know, it seemed to be going on forever. So Habib Atas, he told him, Ya Habib, Allah has preferred you over the lot of us. He's given you more than he's given everybody else. Please go. Um, and then when they gathered, all three of them, Habib and Habib Atas Habash and Habib Abdul Qadir, you know how mm, yeah. the whole world comes alive and everything mm. becomes pulsating with light. Yes. Um, they seem to reinforce each other's light. And you know, it becomes this kind of a palpable physical thing. Uh, this is one of the very, very few occasions when I saw them all three together. But it was, I was very impressed by the, the real humility. Yeah. You know, each thinks, uh, he's a Wali, I'm not. You know, I should give him yeah. proper respect. Wali from Ahl Bayt, a great man, yeah. and, and treats him like this. And the other Wali reciprocates. Uh, but on, on the whole, this, um, what you were just saying, that there is no nafs inside, yes. there is no ego, there is no nothing, there is nothing, yeah. but, you know, there, there is nothing but a lie inside. Mm. Zero judgment when you come in front of them, yeah. which is so uncommon these days, it's unheard of almost. 
um, yes, you don't see this and you don't, uh, people don't even aim for this when traveling. They think it's too far-fetched, it's too, yeah. um, uh, but that is really the, the, the real goal of, of uh, following the spiritual path, which is to cease to exist. Yeah, as yeah. you, yeah, yeah, and and, and uh, make room for a lot to come in. And I remember, you know, the young people have a, a sort of fear of coming into the company of these people because they, you know, they, they well, they're going to see all my faults and everything. And I remember you explained that to me, which I always remember. You said to me, you know, they see you at a certain point in your journey. It's mm -hmm. not from a judgment thing, they just see where you are. Mm -hmm. And then, like, if they, you, they foresee difficulties, they pray that they'll be eased. Yeah, they whatever. do what is necessary yeah, at that yeah, stage, yeah. yes. Yeah, and that's a very different transaction, yeah. you know. Yeah, they're not really interested in judging you. Yeah. They're interested in reforming you yeah. and getting you there. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's, it's painful. I have a, uh, I tell this story in, the, in one of the books that I wrote, but it, I am always reminded of it when I was sitting with Sayyid Omar Abdullah in, in uh, Habib's house, in Ali, Habib, Sayyid Ali's house. And Habib was uh, in another room and talking to someone, and I, and I think it was about like where he should live, you know, he's wanted to buy an apartment and it was, and I started, I think, you know, why, why is he wasting his time on this? And then I started thinking about myself coming in and with all my anxieties or whatever I brought in. And I said to Sayyid Omar, we were just sitting quietly, and I said, I don't, I don't know how Habib can stand being around someone like me. Seriously. And he said... Habib only wants to be alive because of someone like you, you know. But he said it with a straight face. He said, uh, he, "Otherwise, he'd rather be with his Lord." Of course. You know. And that, that to me, uh, opened up everything. I understood that transaction. It's, it's a completely selfless, wonderfully selfless way of looking, of, of looking, and I think all of us to the extent that we can, we can, uh, um, we, we can uh, try to, try to emulate that and help people the best way we can, you know, either through translation or writing or, or uh, consulting or, you know, it's, it's, we just try to help. That's the real all. purpose is to get people to know that yeah. these uh, people yeah. exist, yes. that they are there, accessible, yeah. recognizable, yeah. and that they are the only way to progress spiritually. There's no other way. There's no other way. Well, why do you think that this tradition has kind of vanished for a, a while? Because there, I, I don't think there's all that much 19th century material on on the, the Aulia, and the, the Tabakat literature seems to have fallen off after a certain point. Um, not altogether. Oh, no, I'm sure not. Um, but there are many things. Uh, first, the natural gradual deterioration of, of everything. Mm. You know, we're getting on to 1500 years and uh, natural deterioration of the uh, Islamic civilization and Islamic uh, spirituality and knowledge in general, that's one thing. That was steeply accelerated by colonialism. You know, when the uh, European powers came in, they came in with their newly gained materialism, the age of enlightenment, which is mm -hmm. actually the age of inductment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, they, they, yes. this is uh, actually one of the uh, uh, recognizable marks of the devil is that he mm -hmm. redefines things as their opposites. So as far as uh, Christianity was concerned, the age of enlightenment was the age of destruction of Christianity. Mm -hmm. yeah. It wasn't. Yes. So in fact, what was happening was not an increase in light, it was an increase in the darkness mm -hmm. and the disappearance of the light. But they renamed it to sell it to people.
marketed mm -hmm. as enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So that is the mentality they came to us with. And um, they tried to impose it on the uh, colonialized people, some more than others. Some were more vicious than the others. Mm -hmm. some, were, some just wanted to take whatever was uh, uh, for grab, wherever they went, and just leave the people alone. But um, most of the time, they wanted to impose their own values and ideas. Mm -hmm. And some people were obviously receptive, because if you have the bigger guns, you have the louder voice. Yeah. Um, so that we went through a period when uh, many Muslims thought that the only way to get out of this was to become as technological as uh, uh, whereas the uh, shiuch, the uh, Sufis and the um, ulama in general knew perfectly well that the only way to uh, get better mm -hmm. was to return to a stricter uh, but then because of the deterioration of the time, this idea became that, okay, we're going to revert to uh, a stricter form of uh, following the Sharia, but in a purely outward way, materialistic way. And then we had the Salafis and, and whatever came out of this. Uh, yeah. and, and the uh, Sufis, although they were there, were sort of out of sight. Yeah. Sidelined. Sidelined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's when the uh, tabakat uh, market was impoverished. Right. Yeah. Right. But, uh, but you know, the things exist. You have, you can. Yeah. But uh, w what we found uh, with, th through this project was uh, the, the um, paucity of s storytellers. People, Muslims, uh, have kind of lost the art of storytelling yes, and, and I think that because we commissioned f five um, additional books mm. and we had to reject five and they were from scholars and the scholars had information in, in them and, and they understood they, they, they understood what we were trying to do they, they were on the same we thought on the same page but they just couldn't tell a story they couldn't take you from birth to death mm. and, and there was no arc and no so we just had to set aside five five texts because they just didn't get it they didn't understand how to do it because because it's not you know some of the tabakat literature is in, in the the um, the medieval tabakat literature is it's more like a catalog you know it's just a few uh, you know, uh, who the teachers of some of the people were and wh where their ijazes were and so on. And then there were other, others more like Atar and the... Um, oh, Imam Shahrani. Shahrani, Imam yeah. Shahrani's tabakats full of uh, stories the and... Details, uh, yes. And amazing stories, and yeah. not just yeah. the usual stories. Yeah. So, uh, but I think... It, uh, b uh, b because uh, because most of the the great tabakat or the biographies are are ancient, um, it, it leaves the impression that these people do, don't, don't exist, exist anymore. anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we were trying to, uh, and this is what you, you've you've done, and what we're trying to we've tried to do is to just sort of say yes, actually they do exist. You know, have a look. And I, my my favorite passage from your book. Um, <clears throat> Let me see if I can find it. It's the, the last passage. I think is so important. Um, yeah, you you say um, uh, the passing away of Habib Ahmed was but one more instance of this truth, for he left an irreparable breach in the defenses of Islam. Such saints are irreplaceable and leave a permanent emptiness in the hearts of all those who have known them. May God reunite us with him in the, the abode of peace and heal our hearts of their longing. When they hear about him, many of those who missed meeting Habib Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad regret the lost opportunity. Many of the younger generation, now that he has become a legend, who wish they had been living in his time and had the opportunity to simply lay, lay eyes upon him. To both I say that you should not wait for the great men of God alive today to turn into legends. 
mm. uh, and then regret having failed to meet them. Rather, you should waste no time in running to them right now. It's such a beautiful passage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if someone comes to you and say, well, all right, which direction should I run to? What would you tell them? Oh, well, there are lots of uh, spiritual masters still around with us, uh, some of them well-known, uh, well-known to the West, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, some of them less well-known, uh, but um, they're available. Uh, as far as uh, the Alawis are concerned, we have Habib Omar bin Hafiz, we have uh, Habib Ali al-Jifri, no, we have yeah. others uh, as well who are not as well-known, but are still there. Um, but the real point is not that. The real point is that when the seeker is sincere with Allah, then Allah guides him yeah. yes. to the master. Yeah. It's not a question of dealing with people and relying on your own uh, uh, intelligence to decide whether this is a real sheikh or not. Yeah. It's your sincerity with Allah. If you're sincere with Allah, you are... Because all people have this... Um, uh, obsession about uh, falling into the hands of uh, uh, an imposter sheikh, yeah. somebody who's um, just uh, exploiting people, not not yeah. really a real spiritual master, or just pretending to be a spiritual master and not being one. Um, and that is a misplaced fear because when you're dealing with Allah, you can fall into the hands of one of those once and twice, but it yeah. is Allah whom you're dealing with, it is Him you're seeking, it is Him it is for him to save you out of this situation and lead you to the right, yes. to the right person. And that has happened so many times. Yeah. Uh, that people are sincere, they have uh, uh, the will to travel to Allah and they're trying their best. And then they fall into the hands of somebody who is not a real master. And they stay with him for a while. Uh, if he's not an outright imposter, they will benefit. They will learn things. But then Allah will move them from there to a real master who will take yeah. over their affairs and uh, because it is Allah who allocates yeah. the secret to the master. It's neither the master shows nor, nor the, the, the seeker. It, it, uh, it is, uh, so you have to learn how to put it entirely into Allah's hand and he will lead us to the real spiritual master. You know, you can't just take a list and, and start... Uh, Crossing uh, them off. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you don't do this. Uh, yeah. But you have to keep trying. Yes. You have to keep trying because people have found their masters in most uh, amazing manners, no, unusual. Yeah. So uh, it is Allah who's doing everything. You just leave your affair to Him and He will lead you. Yes. I mean, in his uh, biography, his autobiography, Ibn al Habib talks about uh, in the turn of the night between the 19th and 20th century when he was but actually even before the turn of the century he was young and, and searching he said he was blessed because there were so many of these people and he said some some of them would just look at look on me and make dua for me and they would were part of his his journey and he, the, for his first sheikh, who he met, had, had not really completed the journey. Um, he, 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 but it led him to the, his, you know, his shuyukh, uh, who, who perfected him and went to, took him on the path. So it's, it's it was step by step. And uh, I think one of, one of the young, many young people, think that they have to have some grand sheikh that knows everything or that they think knows everything. But there are also people on the way, you know, sincere people who can, you know, help, help them to keep them in good, good company, with good akhlaq, with, you know, all attributes from the shuyu that they've, they've They've learned they give you what they have and then move you on. And move you on. And I think there is, a, because I, I, I notice young people today, they want everything to happen immediately. immediately. They think they're going to, you know, take baya and then suddenly end up as a, you know. Uh, the one the next day, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's instant nirvana or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, it's a long trek. Yeah. yeah. It's a long, long trek. Yeah. It's a long, but there's no other way. Why do you want yeah. it?
Yeah. That's what Allah says in the Quran. Where are you going? Yes. Where yes. is there to go? Absolutely. But you, you've met so many uh, of these people. I mean, the, the, the uh, meetings with mountains is, is uh, what that is, uh, 50 years work? It's 50 years project and there were many I left out because um, although I met them and I felt that they were somebody, I, I didn't, I wasn't with them long enough to be able to write anything about them. And so, you know, I mean, there's many I had to leave out and I didn't want to, but I just couldn't add anything beneficial. Really, but some of the pictures really say everything. Yeah, well that's what I hoped really. I think both with meetings and this, we were very keen that there was women in there because otherwise the concept is this is a very patriarchal world and you know and, and Habib Ali said at the launch no it's, it's 50 50 50 it's 50 yeah 50, definitely. 50 but they're out of sight because they're out of sight yes and I think it a lot of that no and I think a lot of it is to do the time do the time we're living in you know yeah. uh, the women are not really respected particularly in Western societies and, and maybe they're hidden for a purpose, you know. They One of the things that we learned uh, in studying, uh, particularly w the women awliya, is uh, Mohedin ibn Arabi, uh, he, he um, bestowed the khirka, uh, symbolizing the, the, the transmission of knowledge to 15 people only in his life, and 14 were women. <laughs> 14 out of the 15. Out yeah. of the 15 were, were women. And when you start digging into these, the, the, there was a, a Walia in Morocco who used to pray in, in, in Marrakesh with 1,000 women, uh, Aulia, every, every week. You know, I mean, the, 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 and that's, it seemed, that's kind of disappeared. And I'm, 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 not, I'm, and I, I'm not, not sure whether it's spiritual or social, whether the women are. are and in in Tareem, uh, Aziza uh, 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 Spiker, she she spent months there, and there are incredible women, Aulia, the Hababa there. Uh, yeah, the, they're out of sight because out of respect for them. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Muslims keep their women out of sight, out of respect for them, yes. not to keep them down. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in, in Tarim, we find uh, half the uh, women of the family are from uh, yeah. are Aulia. Yeah. You know, you, you talk to the young Habaib and say, yes, my grandmother was like this and my uh, yeah. uh, aunt was like this and uh, my uh, elder sister used to do this and, you know, they're all. Right. The, the family of the Ridwanis, uh, they're, they're all like this. Mashallah. All the women are. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is the normal thing in, in families of Ahlul Bayt. Uh, it's a 50-50, but the women are kept out of sight out of respect to protect them. Yeah. I never forget after the, the Maulid of Lamu, all the shayuk and all the scholars went and kissed the hand of the Hababa, you know, the uh, granddaughter. Uh, uh, I, I, it was one of the most amazing things. I wish I could have photographed it. I knew it was like, I couldn't culturally do it, but it was, it's still like etched into my brain, you know, the respect they had for that woman. You know. She was known to be the big uh, spirit of the, of the place. Yeah. You know, the, the supreme saint of the place. Yeah. So and when I tell people, when I tell people there, especially women, you know, they're just like, really, that, that? Well, the, the other thing that we brought, tried to bring out in the book is the, the, the this, this idea of the, the, the um, use of the word rijal, you know, ya rijal Allah, and that it's, it's gender neutral. And I hadn't realized this, is that it refers to, uh, to, to knowledge rather than gender. So a woman can be a, 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 a rajul, a rajul Allah, yes. and, and, and a man could not be, you would, would, could Wouldn't also be called a rajul, yes. Unless, and they'd say that Maryam, and I think this is from Atar, I, I, I have to, I'd have to go refer to the book, uh, the first when, when uh, well let, let me read that. 
because it's, fa it's fascinating. Uh, sorry. Um, say that Mariam uh, you know some of the Sufis they say um, he the quarter of a man third of a man half a man spiritually speaking a full man is a man with the fatah a man who's a full saint a man a rajul yeah a rajul is a, a saint a fully accomplished complete saint right so uh, a traveler on the bus can be a quarter of a man okay or half a man okay so it doesn't have to do with virility it has to do with spirituality yes so uh, yeah. as Harun says this is really gender neutral because yes. it applies to women a woman can be half a man she it's can be a quarter of a man spiritually that's a spiritual yeah. rank so when they talk about Rijalullah yeah. it yeah. always includes both genders yes yes it's in, in, in this sense of the term, there are women who are Rijal and men who are not. In memorials of the saints, Tathkirat al-Awliya, Farid al-Din Attar declares that God will invite the elect to enter paradise by calling out, Ya Rijal, and that it is Sayyidat Maryam, uh, mother of uh, Jesus, who will be the first to respond to this poem. And women, this is, when, when, when we read this to women, they're uh, astonished, Muslim yeah. women, because this is not what they've been raised on, that they've never had th this kind of information um, shared with them. I mean, mm -hmm. at least in, in the West, in the Western English-speaking world that we're yes, dealing with. Yeah. And, uh, and th this is something we've both really you know, kind of focused on and I well, we've both been we've both been um, sort of criticized for not having more more women you know represented but it's very difficult it we, was we, very difficult yeah. we we asked uh, Muli Hashim Belghiti about uh, where we could find women Aulia and he just laughed and he mm. said it's hard enough to find men yeah, yeah. Aulia he said it's imp almost impossible to find women uh, they're probably be coming out because we're uh, at the end of time and things are opening up and yeah. as you see we're now speaking of things that we wouldn't have dared speak of 30 years ago yes. um, so they will probably be coming out because by force of by force of civilization let's say you know th this uh, civilization will force yeah. them out yeah. and when they but again you see when they come out they hide themselves. Yeah. They don't just come out into the open. Yeah. And you can meet yeah. at uh, Sayyidina Hussein or uh, some place, uh, yeah. uh, a modern made up woman, you know, looks like a university teacher or something. And inside that, there will be something big, but she wouldn't let on yeah. unless circumstances force her. So even if they come out into yeah. the open, yeah. you know, it will not be in, in, in the way that, you know, all the details of their lives will be known and you can write a biography of them. Yeah. Well, I'm always astonished in these visits that we made. I was in Beirut once and a lady who was like a housewife or a mother, very ordinary appearing woman, she told me when she was in, the, in Medina, in, in the Rauda, Every time she made sajda, the face of Rasulullah appeared. Every time. And I thought, <laughs> you, know, I'm, you know, let me have some of whatever you, you, you've, you've been doing, and, you know. And, she, and yet she was just, she wasn't anyone, she wasn't a scholar, she wasn't a, a guide or anything, she was just a, a mother. And so people share, you know, I, I th think that's one of the other things that we, we have an arrogance, you know, that we want to be among the, the pure people and we think we know who those people are. And I, the, every, the more I meet people, the more I realize I don't know, you know. Well, one of the things know. is that people with a the mission, they are literally forced into 
uh, into letting themselves known. Yeah. Uh, if you remember Imam al Haddad uh, when he was uh, in his early 20s, uh, the uh, Grand Sheikh of the Tariq, Imam Faqil Muqaddab, came to him in a dream and told him, uh, Ya Habib, you have to sit to the people and teach them. And uh, Imam al Haddad had no intention of doing any such thing. He was yeah. happy in his seclusion. Yeah. Uh, he lived in a, a small mosque. You know, uh, he had a khalwa there. So he was living alone with Allah. And so he said, يعني, Okay, he's my Sheikh, but you know, there must be some, somebody more knowledgeable. Um, and then uh, time went by, and then he had one of the, uh, the great Ali people coming to him and say, Habib, you should sit for the people. And he said, And then the Prophet came to him no. and yeah. told him, You know, sit. You have to do And that went on for 70 years. Yeah. But uh, you know, he didn't want to. Most of them don't want to. They, they are to. made to manifest themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes under threat. Yeah, uh, this, this even is the prophets, you know, yeah. you think they they want to go and uh, go through what they go through. This is by divine command, you know. You know, yeah. go and do this. Uh, you, yeah. you, they don't. They have no choice. Otherwise, yeah. who would want to leave the presence of Allah, the presence of light, and yeah. go and deal with uh, <laughs> me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 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 true. Um, I, I I I think young people they they are today they they feel very lost, and they're looking for um, a, a solution to their lives, which is perhaps not spiritual. It's maybe yes. psychiatric and social uh, and social psychological uh, and. Um, the, 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 there's a, a lot of um, focus on, on baya, which we really, the, the, this idea of baya was, was a very distant thing for us uh, initially. I don't know what, what, but I took, the first sheikh I took baya from was, was Habib. And it was because Sayyid Omar kept saying, you have to be with Habib. And I said, yes, but you're, you know, you're my sheikh. You're my sheikh. And uh, Habib told me that after he passed away. He said, you know, he was your sheikh. But he, so was Habib. And he, he and then uh, one one year I became very busy and I didn't go to Bani Malik and I didn't see Habib. And I went to his to his house and he was at the airport on the way back to Mombasa. Mm. And I was really traumatized, I was in, in, in tears, and I went straight to the airport, and I found him, and I was, I said, look, I, I, uh, I feel terrible that I, I didn't, I wasted all my time, and I didn't see you, and he said, you're always with me, Harun, and I'm always with, and I told Sayyid Omar that, I said it was so kind of him, you know, it was very sweet, and he said, he, he, he said that to you? And I said, yeah, he was very sweet. He said, no, he wasn't being kind. He said, these people are not allowed to say something like that unless you are connected to him from before time. And so that was the first time I, I, I had a formal baya with anyone. I went to him and I said, I need to... And he said, we've been waiting. And... Um, but now you hear this all the time. Everybody's taking baya with everyone else. What do you, what, what, what do you, what, what's your Well, uh, as you know, the Alawis, they don't really. They don't do this. They uh, don't yeah. do this. Yeah. Uh, uh, and they allow you to um, remain loosely attached to them until they feel that you are so strongly connected that you become part of them. Yeah. And then they give you the equivalent of baya, but not formally. Yeah, well, I, I no mean... No handshake. <laughs> no, uh, you know, they just 
pass it on to you spiritually and they give you the word that's what he, he said this his, no, the, the word uh, is even they, can, had, had they can give it to anybody because it's no I, I know uh, well, that's well, the problem is the young people of today they have a conception of what a sheikh should be and what a tariqa should be and yeah, what yeah. a bayah should be and they have everybody they need yeah. everybody to conform to this in order yeah. to be sheikh yeah. they don't have the flexibility because mainly because of lack of knowledge and lack of experience yeah. of the awliya. If you spend some time with the awliya that you know that, you know, the thing is much more fluid than that and, and uh, the spiritual world doesn't operate according to hard and fast material laws like this. Yeah. So they have to be a little more flexible. Um, and uh, the question of uh, uh, competition between tariqas, this uh, and this is really, uh, this cuts you off from all Absolutely. kind of spirituality, yeah. then you're, you're off track. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. um, one of the really important passages in, in, in the, the Sage of Arabia in your book, your biography of Imam Haddad, was where, when he, it, to me anyway, was when he said, never imagine that you were from the elect, because the, the conditions don't exist for this, uh, at this time. And I think this is something that's not understood uh, by most Muslims today who are s aspiring to spirituality. They don't understand it. We're not in, like in the Middle Ages where, you know, you, you have people who are completed in that, in that time. These were the time. days when the Sheikh would be sitting in 30, well, he had left and said to his right. Yes. You know, the yeah. Whole yeah. Full of. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. No. This is the end of time. Yeah. So we had this uh, just for a couple of years. We had this experience in uh, Morocco after Ibn Habib died because he he lived a long time. I mean, he lived to be a hundred, and he was a sheikh for like sixty, seventy years. And the people in the, those rooms, you, you, there were, I don't know if there were 30 on each side, but there were probably about 20 or 30 people in, in the room. I, I started going gray, just, you know, the first time I encountered that. And I, I used to fall asleep, and he took photographs of me sleeping. <laughs> Protecting yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, in retrospect, I realized that it was probably a good thing. Because it was it was shattering, because there were all these people, and they they, they didn't care about you. They, they cared about Allah. That's all they. That was all they that you saw in the the only transaction. So there was no personality or anything. But now I think, you, like you said, it's very hard to find. Uh, I remember something like maybe 35 years ago when I attended a, a maulid at uh, say the Hamad Ali al Makkis in Mecca. And Habib was there and Habib Abdul Qadir and there was a row of Habayb, something like maybe 12 to 15 on each side. Yeah, you know, the turbans, turbans, turbans. Yeah, yeah. It was very, 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 very impressive. I'd never yeah. seen this before. You know. I'd never even. Imagined it existed, you know. and then, then I began to recognize that uh, not every humble, uh, nondescript person in the background in those circles was a nobody. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were all somebodies. Yeah. 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 Muhammad Alwi Maliki was just an extraordinary. Be I used to visit him with Sayyid Omar, yeah. and his presence was so strong and and he was so i mean in that time to confront the, the you know the salafis and and uh, i didn't get to know him i wish i'd known him more or had some more contact with him but i he just was so heroic and he carried that tradition so well. And I had a, an incredible experience. I, the, I think one day I had to do something at King Abdul Aziz University. And I went into the cafeteria for lunch and it was kind of disgusting. You know, everyone was throwing their plates and, you know, eating 
without any any adab. And, and the next day we went to uh, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Alawi's place in Hijun, you know, the old place. And he had his students, and they were like angels, you know. They were they were they're perfect adab and serving and uh, so elegant. And the contrast was so striking, you know. Uh, what he what he managed to do. And, Traditional uh, versus modern. Uh, and and he and he, he died very young, you know. He, he was uh, I think he was only about sixty when he passed. Sixty something years. Uh, which was a, well, a loss. I asked Sayyid Omar, asked him, Sayyid Omar uh, knew his father, uh, Sayyid Alwi Maliki, and uh, I said, what? and he, he knew his, uh, Sayyid Muhammad when he was a boy, and I said, what was he like? And he said, very naughty. Yes, <laughs> yes he was. <laughs> you know this how? Did you hear some? I, I've heard the people, everybody in Mecca knew of it. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I mentioned amazing. this to someone who, 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 I mentioned this to someone who knew it, you know, who had studied with him. He said, he was naughty when he was grown up. I mean, he was mischievous, you know. I, I really wish that we'd had more uh, contact with him. I'm very grateful because you took, you took me to, you interceded for me to, do his picture at a time picture, when yes. he didn't see people, you know, during Ramadan yeah, and stuff, yeah, and he yeah. very graciously yeah. allowed us to come after Maghrib and yeah. take the pictures. You know. yeah. I was really anxious for a good picture of him to be taken because, you know, you, you people, they don't pose for people. Yes. So you have yeah. to um, snatch a picture. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so, so your appearance was um, <laughs> <laughs> A good opportunity to have a really good portrait of him. Yeah, I'm grateful. And then I, I met him again later, just before he passed away, when he was much greyer. And mm. Alhamdulillah. Okay, shall we stop there? Do you want to... Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, I could go on all <laughs> afternoon, you know, if you want. Yeah, maybe we have the same, no, I think the same here. But no, no, it's beautiful. It's no, really no, useful. I would love to, uh, just to capture this, you know, these kind Because I don't know when I'm going to see you again. Oh, soon, I inshallah. Wallahi. <laughs> soon, inshallah. So, uh, so good to see you.